Well, hey everyone, it's Hudson, and I wanna welcome you to this first of my Approaching the Scene Thursday videos. Uh, you know, I, I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna take a few of your questions, and then I'm gonna kind of relook at how I currently use the, the fluid head that I use for still photography. Uh, I'm gonna go through some of the tips and tricks, things I've learned since I last put out a video on fluid heads. Uh, and, you know, I hope that if you enjoy this video series, you'll consider subscribing. And before I jump into kind of the meat of the content of this week's video, I want to take a few of your questions. And there's always a spot for you to, to submit questions. You can submit them to me via email. You can do it via my social media, whether it's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or there's a, a link right here to submit your questions. So I'm going to jump in. Steve asked the question, if I have a lens that will open to f3.5 at 18 millimeters, but has a claimed four-stop optical image stabilizer, is it really equivalent to an f1 or f1.4 capable uh, lens? And, and the answer to that is absolutely not. It's two completely different things, having a really wide aperture, uh, intense light gathering lens, and a lens with really good optical image stabilization. When you have a, a lens that's f1.4, let's say, you know, setting aside the f1 lens, uh, it, it lets an intense amount of light in, which at the same ISO as a lens with f3.5 or f4 is gonna allow you to have a much, much faster shutter speed. So let's say you're working an event in dim light and people are moving around. Well, with that optical image stabilization, it isn't necessarily going to stop you from having blurred subjects as subjects move. It isn't going to get you that faster shutter speed that that wider open aperture will get you. The other thing it doesn't help you with is, is a shallow depth of field. These lenses with really wide open wide apertures like f2.8 and below tend to allow you to blur the background or blur the foreground and create three-dimensionality in your image by having just the part that you want sharp and in focus. And so those are some differences. Now, today with the amazing ISO performance of modern cameras, it makes a little bit less of a difference. You can ramp up the ISO and still keep that nice sharp shutter speed, but that depth of field is a huge difference. And it's why the, the bigger, wider aperture lenses cost more money, way more, uh, but there's some really great benefits to them as well. Donald has a question about his D700, and for years and years and years I photographed with the Nikon D700, and I don't want to take a whole bunch of time because not everybody's a Nikon fan, but uh, he asks a couple of quick questions, and one is really D700 related. It's about how do I get into live view. On your D700, there's uh, on, on the, the control dial, when you push down the button and rotate through the different drive modes and, and your, uh, your timer mode, there's a live view switch on there. So you actually have to rotate that command dial to where it says LV for live view. And then when you hit the shutter button all the way down, it'll lift the mirror and go into live view. So it's a kind of a two-step process. Rotate that wheel into live view, then push the shutter. The second question that you asked, Donald, is, is not so much D700 related. It's about the fact that when you're photographing in low light, blue hour situations, you tend to get these daylight looking images. And I think that's a pretty common thing. Um, I often photograph in the blue hour with you know two thirds of a stop or a stop of underexposure built in as I'm photographing in manual. I tend to want to be photographing on a tripod in manual exposure mode, no auto ISO. I'm making all the decisions and I'll just dial in a little bit of underexposure till I get that look that I want on the back of the camera. And I'm checking my histogram. I'm, not making, I'm making sure I'm not horribly underexposing my image. I want to have a little bit of detail on that right quarter of the histogram. Uh, just because if you really underexpose an image and then in post-production you want to brighten it up, you tend to introduce noise. And that doesn't happen if you have an image that's a little brighter than you want, but not overexposed, losing any highlights, and you just want to darken it up. So, you know, I think that your editing process should always inform your shooting process and vice versa. So it's something that I would just practice with a little bit. Photograph some stuff on the meter, photograph some stuff a little bit underexposed, do it at the same time so that you have both choices when you go back to edit. And, and try taking those images that were photographed on the meter and just sliding your exposure slider back a little bit, your highlight slider, and, and all the different sliders that you have for tone in your post-processing, raw processing software and see if you get the look that you want. And then try it with the ones that are slightly underexposed at blue hour and see which you like better. Um, you know, and, and jump on, let me know what you like. I'd, I'd love to hear back from you. 
So then finally, there's more of an artistic question from Kevin, and it's about the fact that with so many other people out there imitating the greats, you know, whether it's Ansel Adams or whether it's a great portrait photographer, uh, or they're watching their social media feeds and trying to create images just like they see on social media, you know, how, what can we as photographers do to work towards creating something unique and something our very own, something different? And I think that that's, that's a really big topic and it's something that I'm exploring in the training videos that I'm working on right now. I've got a couple of courses in production. Uh, one's just sort of on the core process of photography. Another's on panoramas, another's on HDR, and, and I'm trying to kind of build some of those concepts into that. And you know, there's no quick and easy answer. It, it's something that uh, that I try to kind of instill in my workshop students and in my courses that you should spend some time with whatever your subject is, whether it's a person, whether it's a place, whether it's a thing, sort of thinking about what emotions is it evoking you? How does it move you? How does your subject move you? And if your subject doesn't move you, well, then maybe you should be photographing something different, right? Um, so however that moves you, think about how you could use the tools at your disposal. You know, exposure, different angles of light, different types of light, times of day, um, optics, different, different focal lengths, Survey the elements that you have at your disposal. How are you going to combine those? What do you want to avoid having in the scene? What do you want to have in the scene? What should be large and front and center and what should be far and distant in the background? Just think about ways to tell the story that your subject is, is telling you. And I think that spending a little time with your subject without the camera in your hand before you actually start setting up to photograph something is just crucial towards that process. Again, there's nothing wrong with going out and recreating beautiful images that you've seen other people take and bringing those home and being proud of them. But it's always good to try to work to find how that subject moves you and find your own unique way of capturing it. So great questions, everyone. Remember, there's a link to submit more questions and I'll be answering those each and every one of these videos. So I wanna jump in and talk just a little bit quickly about fluid heads. I think most of you who follow me have probably seen one or both of the fluid head videos that I've done in the past. I'm a huge aficionado of using fluid heads in the field for both still work and for video work, obviously for video work, but for stills as well. And after having used them for as long as I've been using them now since 2013, there's just no way I could go back to regularly using any ball head, even the best of the best, the really right stuff, BH55. I would much rather have this lightweight, uh, cheaper Manfrotto any day of the week just because it's so much easier to use for what I like to do. And, and I'll show you the fatal flaw for me of the ball head in most cases. And it's the fact that, you know, let's say I get set up in a scene and I photograph it and I, I get it and I think, hmm, I'd like it to be a little bit, a little bit tilted up. Well, you know, I need to re-level the camera. The minute that I start moving the ball, I lose the level, I lose the whole orientation. I really have to work to be careful to just move it a little bit, to just compose a little bit, to make those fine tune adjustments. And the other thing I don't like is that if I, if I forget to set it and let go, it'll flop and it can flop devastatingly, particularly with long lenses. And there's no real way to get the camera balanced on a ball head. Um, now, you know, some cameras have the ability to pan at the bottom, but unless you set the legs up perfectly level, uh, that pan is gonna throw you out of level the minute that, that you do it because you've leveled using the ball and setting it at an angle that's not straight up and down. You know, the same thing is true of capturing a simple panorama on the ball head. You really need to have a panning clamp on the top that's isolated so that you level that panning clamp and that's just one extra step for a simple panorama that you're not worried about parallax or having close and distant objects moving in relation to each other. You know, if you've got a big wide open vista and you want to capture a panorama, you know, you can set up with a fluid head and just do it really quickly and easily. So I'll show you the difference here. The difference with a fluid head is that we level the head from beneath. So in this particular tripod, I have a bowl and this little Manfrotto fluid head has a bubble level inside it. I just tilt it forward, level it, and then whatever I do with this head, I can loosen an adjustment that lets it pan, loosen an adjustment that lets it tilt. Whatever I do, it stays perfectly level however I move it. And you know, for those of you that haven't quite bit the bullet and bought a fluid head yet, uh, you know, if you have the ability to buy a tripod with a bowl, a 75 millimeter bowl, 
and then this, this ultra lightweight Manfrotto, that's a real nice way to go because you just have this kind of ball joint that you can level the head with from beneath. Um, if you're intent on using your older tripod that has a flat top plate uh, that's not removable and changeable to a bowl, the same company that makes this ultra light ball head, Acrotech, which is the only one that I keep around for doing time lapses and having a really lightweight rig to set up beside my main camera. Uh, they make a leveling adapter that goes between a flat plate and one of these bowl heads that are ball, fluid heads that just lets you flip a big lever and quickly and easily level it. Now I'm going to put a link to a page with all the links to these products, both at B&H and Amazon. Um, and it's really easy to just slap that thing in between. Doesn't take much space, not terribly heavy, nice big knob and a big beautiful bubble level for you to see whether you're level or not on the side. That's my favorite one. I actually like it better than the really right stuff version. So just something to keep in mind and it's cheaper. So, you know, the things that I've sort of changed about how I use the fluid head, for those of you that have watched the earlier videos, one big thing is I really like this company. I think it's, it's HAOPE, H-A-O-P-E. Um, they make this nice big, you know, uh, Arca Swiss clamp that has a really long knob that sticks out. And I've taken into mounting it on the fluid head's plate. So the fluid head has a Manfrotto plate, which videographers have used for years. They just mount directly to their camera or their lens. And instead I mount this Arca Swiss clamp perpendicularly on it so that when I drop it into the top of the fluid head and tighten it down, it sits here and that knobs off the back and it's really easy to drop my camera in with its L bracket and just lock it down there so that it's firmly attached to the fluid head. If I want to go to portrait orientation, I just flip the L bracket. It's as easy as that. If you don't have an L bracket, you're really up a creek if you want to get into a vertical orientation on a fluid head. The fluid head really means you need an L bracket on your camera in order to just quickly and easily flip vertical and horizontal. Now for years, even with the ball heads, I much prefer an L bracket than flipping the ball head on its side and making it even more ungainly and off balance. So I think an L bracket's a good thing no matter what setup you're using. And having this thing mounted in here at 90 degrees to the, to the fluid head makes it a real piece of cake. One of the things that I love about the fluid head is once you've got that plate in there, you can loosen this and slide the camera forward and backward and get it to where it's nice and balanced. And when you let go, so right now I have the plate tightened, pulled a little back to keep the balance point. I can let go and there's absolutely no camera flop whatsoever. So I don't have to worry about the camera falling over and taking a big hit. If there's a long lens and it's tilted some, it'll come down slowly, but the fluid keeps it from going really fast and being catastrophic. And so speaking of the fluid, for those who haven't used a fluid head, when you're doing video work, there are two adjustments with the fluid head. There's the pan and there's the tilt, and both of them have a little fluid resistance. So you can lock one and simply pan. You can move a little to the right. You can lock the pan and simply tilt, or you can open them both to get your composition. And no matter what you do, you remain perfectly level because you've leveled it from beneath. And so one of the great things for video, if you happen to do any video, is you can track a subject and by just applying kind of equal pressure, the thing will just move smoothly along in a perfect pan because that fluid kind of holds it back and keeps it from being stuttery and loose. There's no real way to pan like that, let alone tilt with a ball head. It's just impossible. So it becomes the one head to kind of rule them all. I think when you set up and you've got a scene composing, you think, oh, I'd like to shift a little right. You just loosen that pan knob, tilt a little right. You don't lose level. You don't lose any part of your scene. Oh, I'd like it to be just a little bit up. Boom. No worry about level. It's that quick. It's that easy. Nice, big, easy to access knob at the base. Really big, easy to access knob on the side. Those are your only controls. That and sliding the camera forward and aft by moving that little adjuster. So. The biggest change for me has been switching to this particular plate. And I know you may wonder, well, what if you're using a long lens with a foot that's, that's oriented with an Arca rail this way? It won't go onto that because it's set up the wrong way. And that's true. But what I do in those cases is I just use a panning clamp. So I've got a panning clamp. This is by Really Right Stuff. They make my favorite panning clamps. There are cheaper alternatives. I'll put links to both of them. But it has a little dovetail. Um, attachment here on the bottom that can just slide right in there and clamp like the camera would. Oh, I think I missed it. I got to open it up a little bit wider. There we go. And so I'll just lock it in there, pan that thing so that it's 
the orientation that I want, lock the head off, and I can mount my lens in there. Lickety split, done, piece of cake. The other thing that's nice about this is if I wanna capture a panorama, I can move this thing over, level it. I've got a bubble level right on that. So just for the, as far as the, the, the tilt goes, you want it nice and level. And I can set up and either rotate around with a, a pano. I don't even really need to do that. But if I'm gonna get out over the nodal point, if I've got a, a pano that I'm worried about parallax, and I'm doing an advanced panorama, I can just set up like that, get right over my nodal point, loosen that, and, and do my pano lickety split. So just having that is kind of a dual purpose weapon for me. If I'm doing a simple panorama, and it's just that kind of wide open vista with nothing close in the frame to worry about parallax, I don't even need this, you know? I don't need that panning clamp at all. I can just set up the camera, and because this thing stays level no matter what, I can just go ahead and pan to do my panorama. You can even, if you really wanna take the time, figure out what your nodal adjustments are, make marks on here, and use that, that rail, that, that, that top plate on the, on the head to get your nodal point. I prefer to just do it with the same nodal adapter that I use for my complex, my, my kind of advanced pano setup. Um, so, that's a topic for another day. We'll talk a lot about panoramas in these videos. But um, another change that I have, so I'm just keeping this one big clamp on here, real easy to access. The other thing I do is I just pop this whole plate off, and when I'm gonna use a really long lens, and I want the fluid head to act like a gimbal, because it not only does video and stills better than a ball head, it also acts like a gimbal, which is, which is just awesome. It's not a perfect gimbal, but it's real close. So here's you know an, a 400 millimeter F3.5 Nikon lens. It's kind of a classic. I've used it in a lot of different situations. It's a tried and true friend of mine. And the nice thing is, I, I, all I do is I mount a longer version of these Manfrotto fluid head plates right onto the lens's foot, and I keep it in the bag. It's low profile, not much different than an Arca Swiss plate. And I keep the top loose a little bit, keep the, the tilt adjuster loose, and just find that balance point where the camera's not flopping, and then lock that plate in place. And right now I have everything loose on the tripod, and this thing is not flopping around. And I could move around, staying completely level, and track birds in flight, anything just like I would with a gimbal, staying perfectly level like I would with a gimbal. And when I let go, it generally stays in place. Now, if I'm heavily tilted, it is gonna fall, but you see it falls pretty gently. If I lean it back, it's not falling fast in this catastrophic way. That's because of the fluid in the fluid head. So, to me, fluid head just sort of solves all the problems that I have in still photography at the same time as it solves the problems for videography. And it weighs exactly the same as a really right stuff BH55 head. And these things run somewhere between $135 and $170. I don't know why they fluctuate, but they do. I'm gonna put links for the fluid head, for the leveling adapter if you wanna use your old tripod, for this long clamp, for the long plates for your long lenses, and for some panning clamps on there. And I just think it's a system that you can't go wrong with. Everyone I know who's switched over is as happy as I am. So that's kind of my update. If you have any questions about that, submit them. You know where to send them. Hope you guys, if you enjoyed, choose to click subscribe. I'm really, really excited about this series and I wanna thank you so much for tuning in.